just explain your work like you would in front of a group for the first time, just who you are and what you do. Yeah, so I'm Andrew Menard. I'm the founder of Bovi. Effectively, what Bovi does is we build underwriting tools for agricultural banks with initial focus on collateral verification for livestock lenders. What we've built is we've developed computer vision models that use high resolution satellite imagery to remotely verify feeder cattle and rangeland cattle basically anywhere in the US or world at a real, really low friction point that's very scalable and easy to use for the agricultural lenders that want to reduce their fraud risk and improve some of their efficiencies and reach of their inspection activities. Hmm. And so what exactly are these lenders wanting to know? Do they just want to verify that the cattle actually exist or the livestock actually exist? Or, you know, what exactly are they wanting to know? Yeah, there's a, a lot of different factors that go into underwriting livestock assets. You have ownership, you have the quality of the asset, and you have the physical presence of the asset. Ideally, we'd like to expand into all three of those, but our initial approach has been to help them just physically inspect the quantity of the assets that they're looking at. And they typically could go and do this in person, which is certainly a, a good avenue or option, but sometimes labor limitations and regional proximity it, it can be difficult to get out there as frequently as might be desired, especially for an asset that turns over multiple times a year. You can lose some visibility in that delta there. And so we just help them turn off that dial up or down in a way that's scalable to meet whatever f frequency or visibility requirements that particular loan might need. And where, you know, I could see one problem, which is what you're describing here. It's like, hey, it's kind of expensive and labor intensive to send someone out and like count cows. But there's another problem here too, right? Which is where the lack of validation has sort of bit these lenders. Can you maybe talk about some of some of those issues that have popped up? Some of them have, you know, achieved sort of national news. Yeah. And that's something that really sparked our initial interest in this segment was seeing how some of these very large fraud cases, you know, th these lenders would say, hey, we've got 70,000 head of animals or cattle out in, you know, Panhandle of Texas, and we're inspecting once a year, and we go out one year, and there's only 10,000 head there. So obviously you can have, you know, tens if not hundreds of millions of dollars of losses on those extreme cases. And what we found is interesting is, you know, there's, like I kind of mentioned, these agricultural assets that are on four legs, so livestock in general, have a lot of unique complexities, especially regarding ownerships and liens, as far as just the cash markets, and the transportability. And we felt that the inspection protocols were missing the ability to, to really match the complexity of the asset that they, they're underwriting. And something that was interesting that we found was, as we were digging into this, we were like, hey, you know, these might just be headline cases, one-off instances. And we actually talked with a few people that litigate these kind of things and serve as legal counsel for these kind of bankruptcy filings. And they brought up a really interesting point. They said, you know, when you're a house, a homeowner, for example, you might see a leaky pipe in your house once every five years, once every 10 years. He's like, but if you're a plumber, you see the leaky pipes every day. And he was like, we're basically the plumbers in this industry deaths, you know, once, twice, three times a week in ranges of, you know, one to $20 million. And so now we're under no illusion that just missing inventory is the only root cause of this. There's a lot of different ways things can go wrong, but we're trying to just go through a few of the checklists and ways things can go wrong and build tools that add a little bit of a quantitative back end to some of these, what may be otherwise manual practices. Yeah. And I mean, there are some instances that are just clear fraud, probably malintent happening. I mean, if you if you're receiving financing for 70,000 and you only have 10,000, you probably had a lot of time there to kind of come clean and chose not to. But I imagine that there are it, just due to the natural velocity of animals that are going through an operation, you might end up with fewer than the lender would be comfortable with. And it's just, it just doesn't, you know, it's not, there was malintent, but it just sort of happens. Is that true? Yeah, I think so. I think that whenever you have a reduced visibility and an accurate count or account that may be accurate, but only conducted once a year, you know, a lot of these lenders look at a borrowing base, just kind of a balance sheet of sorts. 
that says, okay, given the amount of inventory, equipment, feed you have, we can extend you this line of credit. Well, if those inventory numbers are off, either high or low, either A, you're not able to receive the amount of credit that you'd like, or you might be overextended. With these lenders, they also are setting loan loss reserves that help them estimate risk and might hurt some of their earnings. And so fine tuning some of these things, I think has a lot of advantages outside of the extreme fraud cases that we might see. And another note that I would say is, as we kind of dug into some of the fraud theory, a lot of this fraud tends to snowball. And I don't think that there's a lot of people who are set out to say, hey, we're gonna be big fraudsters. We're just shady individuals. And that certainly happens. But a lot of the times it's someone gets in a bad situation, they try to play the market to get out of it. And pretty soon they're in over their head and trying to get losses recouped. It's just a really bad situation. I think that our goal is that we can help people prevent that and get on the front end of it. Because at the end of the day, it doesn't help a lot of the good producers that might not be in that situation. It certainly doesn't help someone who's getting deeper and deeper in some fraudulent activity and certainly doesn't help the banks. So this seems like a tricky one to identify, like how big of a market is this? You know, like how much is lost every year from this? And I'm sure as you were starting the company, that was something you were trying to understand, like, all right, is this a big of a, enough problem for the average lender that the average lender will want to buy this, this Bovi service? How have you approached that question? Well, I think the average lender is tough because every bank varies in size and geographical reach. And so I think our initial target as some of these larger banks that are putting out very large lines for credit to large fee yards. So that's kind of been our initial focus where we saw that fraud problem be most prevalent. If you're a small community bank, you might be down the road from your feed yard that you finance and your ability to gain visibility on those operations might not be as difficult if you were a bank located in Omaha who was financing feed yards across Colorado, Texas, South Dakota. And so I think that average bank, when I look at our initial market, is significant in the loan volumes, but smaller in the number of organizations. But then we also look at a lot of these smaller banks that might be more dispersed and just their ability to invest in technology and really leverage some of these emerging technologies that we're excited about when you think of machine learning and computer vision. And we think that there's an opportunity to help augment some of their other practices, but that's further down the road, Matt. Yeah, I do want to talk about that. And I, I, I just knowing what little I do about you, I had a feeling there was a, hey, this is the immediate need. And then we see an opportunity to really kind of land and expand. So I want to talk about that before we do, though. Did you listen to the Ghost Herd podcast? You listened to, or it, it, there was a, I think it was that one. It was a, po a podcast sort of about some of this fraud that, that happens. And I'm curious if you have any classic cases of fraud where you're like, it speaks directly to why you started Bovi. Yeah, well, there's a few large cases. I think that Ghost Herd one was specifically related to Tyson in the Easter Day case. That was certainly one. There's a more recent one with Robo was a, a big player and, and financer of that one. Those are two of those that had a little bit more recency bias that really got us started looking at, again, like I was saying, maybe not like, okay, there's always gonna be one-off things that might not be a good use case for a business, but kind of provide the impetus to dig in a little bit deeper. And I was able to do a research project in grad school that allowed me to really dig into the mechanics of five soft financing with a lens of how does fraud happen? What are the root causes and overall market sentiment? So it was a lot of customer discovery that I was able to do through that to try to suss out what's the right way to approach this, where do some approaches fail and where can we kind of win? And, you know, computer vision, AI, machine learning, you know, those are relatively new technologies, but not brand new technologies. Why do you think a solution like this hadn't been brought to the market before? At least I'm assuming it hadn't. Yeah. So our approach has been to be fully remote. And that was kind of the primary driver on our technology selection was customer requirements. So a lot of technologies exist when it comes to precision agriculture, especially related to livestock. 
And a lot of those add some frictions to the producer and they might be well worth it, but they add some frictions to the producers, add some implementation, some costs. And what we were saying is, well, let's start with what does the lender care about and not try to over-design a solution that solves all the problems in the industry, but solves a really focused problem. One of the things we landed on was the need to be as fully remote as we can and really low implementation frictions. And so at the same time, we saw some really interesting trends with satellite imagery, both in the spatial and temporal resolution that was kind of reaching an inflection point where the resolution was high enough to detect in them individual animals and the reach and frequency was high enough to meet the lender's needs for frequency. And so then we, as we kind of triangulated on that, like you said, computer vision isn't new, hadn't really had the resolution to be effective in this regard. And it's still kind of, you know, we're right on the edge of it being possible or feasible. And then the, you bring in the power of some of those neural networks to really detect the nuances in the imagery that we use to reach accuracies that, that are also sufficiently, sufficiently accurate for the, the lender's requirements as well. Last year, I read and did an episode on the book Cattle Kingdom about kind of the, the cattle bonanza of the 18, you know, 1800s. And one of, you know, they talked about all of the crime and fraud and things going on. I remember one story in particular of a guy who was trying to validate he was buying as much cattle as he thought he was buying. And the person selling it just kind of ran his cattle around twice. So it looked like there were, <laughs> were double amounts of it. And I, that's funny because, you know, it's just kind of like a really antiquated way of doing it. But uh, it brings up a point that like, we really haven't come all that far from, from that in the 1800s to prior to bovi. It's kind of still the same thing. Somebody going out there and physically like looking at how many cattle are out there, right? Yeah, well, even within the past 20 years, some of those methods have remained. There's stories about lenders who were brought out one day, shown a pasture of, of cattle, and then brought out the next day and shown a different pasture of cattle that were coincidentally the same cattle that were moved. So again, the cattle wrestling and fraud in any industry is not new, but we have strong conviction that we have some of the tools available to wrangle it in a little bit and help provide the lenders with really quantitative tools that help them, you know, level up some of those inspections and verification. Is it going to be perfect? No, but just removing that risk a little bit is kind of our goal and our thesis behind it. And we've been talking strictly about cattle and it is called bovi, which makes me think you're pretty cattle focused, but do you see an opportunity in any other agricultural context where this might be important or relevant? Yeah. So I feel like with companies, they're always starting where you have a, a thesis in the starting point and you have to be flexible and, and willing to pivot. And so, yes, we have focused on cattle, but I think we're also looking and saying, okay, where may we have not had our eye out for, but could be valuable. And one of the things that we're starting to move into is some of this mobile-based develop or uh, mobile-based verification. Again, mobile-based verification isn't new, but especially with some of these confinement barns, which coincidentally, you can't use satellite imagery that can see through, see through roofs. And at the same time, especially with some of the biosecurity concerns, some of the lenders can't actually go in and inspect it. And so they're really flying blind in that regard, even on an annual basis. And so we think that there's an opportunity to create, we're not exactly sure how it's going to look, but what we're working on now is some mobile based application that uses georeference georeferencing tagging and timestamping to allow the lender to send a link to the producer, have them collect visual information on their phone camera. And then we can also build in some computer vision verification on certain qualities that the lenders might look for. Again, just trying to figure out ways that we can not let the perfect be the enemy of improvement. You know, obviously you could be there every day. You could have a live stream, all of this but we just want to reduce the friction and help them increase the frequency so they can have increased visibility. So that's, that's one of the areas that we're looking at is how can we help them get greater visibility in confinement barns? And I think that that's probably our next play. So definitely not limited to cattle. And I would say we're still pretty focused on livestock because we think that that's where the need is probably the greatest. Mm -hmm. uh, but we think there's also opportunities within equipment and maybe some crop drive as well. Sure. And in the cattle context, why can't these lenders just start requiring 
EID tags so that you know okay. they can confirm with those that the cattle do exist. Yeah. So I personally, you know, I think EID tags are great. I think that there was a long time where I was like, this is the solution. This, this should solve it. And then, you know, it just kind of spent however many years and still going on. One of the things that we learned is this goes back to our kind of remote low friction approach. Lenders are competitive, right? They're competing with other lenders, interest rates, stuff like that. And if you're an, a lender who's competing for a customer and you're asking or requiring that customer to make a big financial change or implementation change, you're going to get some pushback and you might risk losing that business. And so we're kind of, we've heard that from lenders. It's, you don't really want to do ask them to make a lot of changes just from a lending standpoint, but that's kind of a, a tricky situation for lenders. Second is the idea of being truly arm's length. And this is also a tricky thing. This is why we think that some of these remote verifications are important, but where are the vulnerabilities in the system for any tampering? And I think that there's a lot of good solutions with the EIDs, but how are you verifying that that EID tag is on an animal? How do you verify where that data is stored? And can it, is it truly immutable? And so we've seen that in the, even lenders that are lending to operations that have EIDs and every single animal are still out there once a year because they don't feel that those EIDs are, are perfectly arm's length or even for just their own sanity, they need to be out there with eyes on the animals. Sure. And, and give us a snapshot of Bovi as a company today. When did you start? Uh, have you raised money and, and what's the team look like today? Yep. So actually a lot of this started in grad school when I met my co-founder, he was in the MBA program with me and also earning his master's in the engineering kind of a focus on this machine learning and computer vision. And then we officially launched last July, August. We recently got through our pirate programs. A lot of our funding has been non-dilutive grants. We've bootstrapped and been really capital efficient throughout the process. A large part of that is just the fact that we're both engineers and fairly technical and can do a lot of the technology development by ourselves. Then we went through the pilot programs and we kind of run the backside of these where we are saying, okay, what we thought would work worked in a lot of ways better than we had hoped it would. We think this is feasible and we've tested this with a couple of reputable organizations. And so now we, um, we have a team of three, myself, my co-founder, James, and a software engineer. And our goal now is just to kind of grow and expand now that we know that what we initially set out to do is working. <laughs> 